Good afternoon. It's Sunday, February 1st. I'm Ariel O'Sullivan, and this is IBA News broadcasting from Jerusalem. In Jordan, worried relatives of captured fighter pilot Lieutenant Mahath al Kasasbe are pleading with the government to be more open about negotiations for his release. The pilot's family held a silent candlelight vigil in his hometown as a reminder of his plight. The fears for his life became even more acute after Islamic State executed Japanese journalist Kenji Goto. ISIS has been demanding the release of female death row terrorist Sajida al washawi imprisoned in Jordan, in exchange for al Kasasbe and Goto. But the deal stalled after ISIS failed to provide evidence that the Jordanian pilot was still alive. According to Arab media reports, Jordan is conducting indirect negotiations through tri tribal leaders in neighboring Iraq. al Kasasbe was captured in December when his F-16 crashed in an Islamic State-controlled area in Syria. Jordan is part of the U.S.-led coalition against ISIS, and its pilots have carried out airstrikes against the so-called caliphate since September. An Israeli Arab who fought with the Islamic State in Iraq was indicted in the Nazareth District Court this morning. 20-year-old Maharan Yusuf Haladi, a resident of Nazareth, was arrested by the Shin Bet on his return to Israel on January 10th. Khaladi was charged with contact, contacting a foreign agent, membership in an illegal organization, undergoing military training, and illegally exiting the country. Khaladi was seriously wounded in a coalition airstrike in Iraq and was treated in a hospital in Fallujah. He allegedly participated in five battles with ISIS before he was injured. He crossed into Syria in October last year to join ISIS. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi vowed to battle Islamic terrorists oper operating in Sinai, saying it will be a long, difficult, but strong campaign to rid Egypt of the evil. His statements came days after one of the bloodiest attacks on Egyptian security forces in northern Sinai that left at least 30 Egyptian soldiers and policemen dead. The Egyptian wing of the Islamic State called, claimed responsibility for the attacks, but al-Sisi al accused the Muslim Brotherhood of being responsible. He also accused unnamed foreign countries of aiding and abetting the terrorists. In Thursday's attack, a sequence of bombings targeted security and government facilities in northern Sinai. Well, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed the security situation this morning, saying that Israel was facing security threats on many fronts, vowing that no one has immunity and that Israel will continue to thwart attacks against it. What he did not address were the political issues about his party and the alleged scandals about his wife's behavior. Here with all the latest is IEBA's political correspondent, Ellie Wogelinter. Referring to the terrorist attacks against Egyptian forces in Sinai, Netanyahu said that the state of Israel is threatened on many fronts. Over the weekend, we witnessed how terrorist elements operate beyond our southern border in Sinai, and we have also seen Iran's attempts to open another front against us on the Golan Heights, in addition to the front it is operating against us in southern Lebanon, an apparent reference to the strikes on a Hezbollah convoy in Syria. Said Netanyahu, we have proven that nobody is immune from our intention to foil attacks against us. This is how we have acted, and this is how we will continue to act. Turning to politics, and we'll start with the NGO campaign to dethrone Prime Minister Netanyahu, what Likud is calling a foreign campaign. Likud party representatives held a news conference this afternoon to put forward what they say is evidence of illegal foreign support for the Zionist Union election campaign. Specifically, party members took aim at the V15 campaign, a project headed by several former Obama campaign managers aimed at unseating Likud and installing a left-wing government in its place. <clears throat> it is sad that a party is trying to buy the government with money via the One Voice movement, which is carrying out the V15 campaign, said M.K. Miri Regev, referring to the left-wing NGO, which is the campaign's primary driver. Noting a failed bill she put forward that would have forced NGOs to reveal their list of foreign donors, Regev said the one who shut down that bill was none other than Sippy Livni. It would be interesting to know why. On Friday, the Likud party filed a court motion against the V15 campaign, claiming it was acting as a vehicle for foreign political actors to directly influence the outcome of the March elections, in contravention of Israeli law. This is what Netanyahu's attorney, David Shimron, had to say. Is foreign funding of uh, campaigns which is illegal in Israel and um, um, uh, money is coming from various, um, various uh, bodies that again are not voters but uh, either NGOs or uh, corporate, uh, incorporated bodies that are not allowed to fund Israeli uh, campaigns. So you have uh, very, uh, uh, I would say, very clear uh, breach of, uh, of law and it's uh, a criminal offense in this country. 
Turning now to what is being called Bottlegate, the alleged misappropriation of state funds by the Netanyahu family. State Controller Yosef Shapira said today that he would publish a report on his investigation of the case and denied he had agreed to a delay asked for by Netanyahu's attorney Shimron. No date was given for publication. The allegations suggest Netanyahu's wife Sarah pocketed thousands of shekels in returns on bottles recycled by the Prime Minister's residence. Since drinks consumed in the Prime Minister's residence are purchased by the state, any funds accruing from them belong by law to the state treasury. The Controller's report will also reportedly examine overall spending on luxuries in the Premier's residence on items such as alcohol, flower arrangements, scented candles and catering. The Netanyahu said the funds were collected by them inadvertently and noted that some 4,000 shekels were returned to the state coffers in 2013 by Sarah Netanyahu under the supervision of the Prime Minister's Office financial regulator. Tsipi Livni, co-leader of the Zionist Union Knesset Slate, said that the Prime Minister's Office under Netanyahu consumed a minimum wages worth of alcohol, some 4,300 shekels each month. The Prime Minister's Office retorted today that an inquiry showed the Prime Minister's residence purchased on average a single bottle of wine per day during 2013 and 2014. Aryeh? A single bottle a day. Thanks, Ellie, for that report. Alleged funding of election campaigns by nonprofit organizations is not a new trend, Professor Gerald Steinberg tells IBA's Mark Zutkevich. He says the current reports of funding by NGOs, including U.S.-based organizations, allegedly assisting merits in the Zionist camp, made headlines because of the scale of the funds involved. For many years, Israeli elections and candidates, parties have all gone outside of Israel, particularly to the United States, to raise funds. And that's not unusual, but the scale of this seems to be unusual. And also there's a lot of secrecy and, and questionable behavior which does need to be investigated. Victory 15 is in fact a uh, project of a bigger organization called uh, One Voice, which is based in the United States and has branches in some countries in Europe. And they list a number of partners. It's uh, somewhat ambiguous, their funding is ambiguous, but they list a number of partners which are problematic and need to be at least reported. The State Department is listed as a partner. We don't know what the term partner actually means, and that's part of the problem here. The, uh, there's a problem in the G NGO world in general about often not being transparent and having relationships with funders which need to be explored and presented to the public in more detail particularly when it involves elections. So in this case, in addition, on the um, One Voice website, you see partners that include the New Israel Fund and J Street and the U.S. State Department and many, many other organizations. There are 20 or 30 partners listed there. And if they are, in fact, in some way funding this uh, Victory 15 framework, which is clearly a framework to defeat Prime Minister Netanyahu, then according to Israeli election laws and according to democratic common sense and general rules of behavior, they need to put that information on the table so the public knows who's behind this. There are reports, as you said, that the U.S. State Department is funding NGOs to remove Prime Minister Netanyahu from power. Um, but you're also saying that this is not a new trend. What do you mean by that? Well, the state, the fact that the Israeli government or the Israeli dem dem democratic process is being a target for other governments, not just the United States, but particularly in Europe, has been a problem for a number of years. Now, in this particular case, the State Department issued a statement saying they have not funded One Voice since November 2014. They are not funding Victory 15. However, if they funded that framework in some way, through November 2014, that's still a form of interfering with Israeli public policy, Israeli democracy, just as the case in Europe, when B'Tselem or all these other groups produce reports which are designed in part to implicate Israel in the allegations of war crimes and also will have an in impact on the Israeli electoral process, that is also a form of interfering with the Israeli democratic process. Those are funded largely by European governments. So this whole area really needs to become much more publicly visible and I think it is a good thing for the Electoral Commission under Judge uh, Jobrin to look at this aspect in its broadest sense but also in terms of if it's a court uh, educated process, that would be good, and for the Attorney General. Large-scale foreign funding, whether it's particularly if it's governmental, needs to be available to the public as information in order to make informed choices, and then there are rules that have to be obeyed for everybody.
According to Israeli law, is it legal for American citizens to be giving tax-deductible uh, donations to organizations who seek to influence the Israeli elections? The, the main aspect of Israeli law for nonprofits, including electoral campaigns, is transparency, especially if you're getting it from foreign governments. It has to be made public because there is a contradiction. You cannot be loyal to a part of a sovereign country and then also be involved in another country. That's a, a non-governmental organization is supposed to be non-governmental. And so those things are problematic. And in fact, there is, first of all, transparency. In the uh, Israeli Electoral Commission website, you can download, any a citizen can go, and anybody can go and download. The problem is, last time I checked, it had not been updated for 2013 or 14 or the current electoral process. Mob violence has once again reared its ugly head after a 20-year-old man was killed last night in a bomb blast in Rehovot. Three people were wounded in the explosion too seriously. The dead man was identified as Yisrael Mahara. Two men who were seriously wounded were in the car when the bomb detonated. The other casualty was a passerby. The explosion took place at about 9.30 p.m. and the victims were in the car and were all known to police. An investigation is underway and it remains unclear whether the blast was the result of a malfunction or if the victims were the target of the blast. The matter is being investigated by the elite police Laha 433 Crime Investigation Unit. Well, archaeologists have discovered a 55,000-year-old prehistoric skull in a cave in northern Israel. The find strengthens the theory that Homo sapiens originated in Africa and the Levant was a stopping point on their way to Europe. In 2008, during sewage construction work in Mushav Manot in the western Galilee, JNF workers accidentally opened up a pier to an enormous cave. The first to go into the cave found beautiful stalactites, but also animal bones, hunting tools, and what is being described today as one of the rarest and remarkable discoveries in the research of the evolution of humankind. Basically what we found here at Manot Cave is a skull, part of a skull, not a complete skull, part of a skull that was uh, dated to 55,000 years. Now, this is one of the most uh, dramatic time in human evolution because at that time period, modern uh, human populations started to evolve. We know that the core populations appeared somewhere in East Asia, East, uh, sorry, East Africa, around 70, 80,000 uh, years ago. And slowly, slowly, they start migrating, coming out of Africa, crossing the Nubian Desert, uh, and arrived here to, to Israel around 60,000. A team of experts from Tel Aviv University, Ben Gurion University, and the Antiquities Authority determined that the skull fragment was 55,000 years old. The skull formed a missing link between the humans who existed in Europe and from Africa. And what we have found is actually the, what we call the uh, uh, missing connection, you know, that the, the piece, the, the piece of the puzzle that we needed actually, you know, to put those two stories together and actually uh, to connect Africa and Europe phylogenetically. This skull is also the first evidence that Homo sapiens inhabited this region at the same time as Neanderthals. On one hand, we have a, a, a very important archaeological site in a cave, and on the other hand, we have a very important Spelotem cave site, and therefore it is very unique. It's hoped that the cave will be open to the public in the coming years, and once again, people will be able to visit the site where this historic milestone in human evolution took place. As the Knesset election draws closer, Israelis are looking for comic relief. And that means the Israeli political TV satire, Eretz Nehederet. Alexander, Alexander Jen has more. It's been a fun discovery for me, REA. For those of you who don't know, Eretz Nehederet is an extremely popular show for the rival channel, uh, too. It's quite similar to America's Saturday Night Live. And due to the election campaign, the show's ratings are through the roof. Probably Zionist or terrorist? Yes, they went there. This is the name of the fictional game show that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu not so humbly wins on the last episode of Eretz Nehederet. It's now in its 12th season and it's as popular as ever with a 30% audience share. During this humorous sketch, Labour Party chief Isaac Herzog and Sippy Livni repeatedly fail to answer rigged questions measuring their nationalism. Netanyahu complains, I'm tired of winning all the time. And Herzog asks the audience, how can he be more Zionist than me? Playing off the recent Zionist camp debate. 
The makers of the show say that they do not have a political bias and poke fun at everyone. We do a thing and whatever happens in the minds of our viewers is their own business and their own, their own, um, their own responsibility. The popular show is considered the biggest campfire Israel has in the way of national politics. Eretz Nehederet, meaning wonderful country, is filmed in a studio outside of Tel Aviv. The Monday Night Satire bases its comedy off of fake news sketches, as well as impersonations of politicians and pop stars. Executive producer of Eretz Nehederet says politicians respect the show's work. They respect uh, the institution of satire in Israel. It's, it's, it's almost a sacred institution, I mean, uh, satirical culture, and um, in Israel, and it's also, you know, it's also a Jewish tradition. So uh, they have respect for that, and they, um, they, they let us do what we want, of course. Netanyahu has no problem with the way he is portrayed, or at least he didn't in the past. He appeared on the show in 2013 to make fun of himself. Here, he holds the tie of his impersonator in his hands and says, more or less. And he's not the only world leader who has acknowledged the influential show. U.S. President Barack Obama joked in 2013, any drama between me and my friend Bibi over the years was just a plot to create material for Eretz Nehederet. Elections in Israel can be very heavy, with life and death issues dominating the debate. So once in a while, a little humor can't hurt, right, Arye? Why, certainly. <laughs> Turning to sports, and it's arguably the biggest day of the year, at least for American football fans worldwide. It's Super Bowl Sunday, and about nine hours from now, the New England Patriots will be taking on the defending champion Seattle Seahawks in Glendale, Arizona. The game will kick off at about 1.20 a.m. Israel time, but that fact will not prevent many thousands of local fans to get up or staying up to watch the 49th edition of the American Classic. There will be an estimated 110 million viewers in the States and 160 million viewers worldwide, making the Super Bowl the second most viewed sporting event of the year after the UEFA Cup Soccer Championship. There are a, no, a number of local Super Bowl parties, and the largest one, sponsored by the Israel Football League, is here in Jerusalem at the first station, the Tachana Rishona, with doors opening at 10 p.m. There will be live performances by several bands until kickoff, and the atmosphere is, in Arizona is electric, but the talk of the town is the high price of the tickets and the ridicule of the Patriots for the so-called deflate gate scandal involving allegedly use of slightly deflated footballs. After all the ridicule we've gone through, just think about it. We've gone through so much ridicule. We have, like, we've been persecuted. We need a win. We need a win. We don't need a win. We've already validated that. We want to win for revenge. And we want an apology, too. The price is absolutely ridiculous. We've been to every Super Bowl, and this is the worst ever. The prices are just crazy. I mean, they... You know, forty-five hundred dollars is like a going rate. I mean, people were pl proud last night in the bars to come up and say, "I got two. I said, "Really? How much you pay? Forty-two hundred." An advertising spot during the Super Bowl cost a record four million dollars for the thirty seconds for the second year in a row. And Israel, an Israeli firm, is running an ad. This year, it's Wix.com, the build-your-own website company featuring legendary quarterback Brett Favre and Lloyd from Entourage. What about Canada? Nope. That indoor league? Nope. What am I going to do? Do what everybody else does. Start a business. Build yourself a website. Welcome to T.O.'s Humble Pie. With Wix, it's easy to create a website. And build your own business. Let's party! Just click, drag, and drop. Create a stunningly beautiful, totally customized, all pro website. All by yourself. Farve and carve. It's charcuterie. You did that yourself? Don't look so surprised. Yeah. Wix.com. It's that easy. I'm going to get something real quick. No rush. Good news for consumers as price of gasoline and electricity dropped overnight. 
Due to the worldwide drop in oil prices, the cost of a liter of 95 octane at self-service pumps has been brought down by 3% and it now stands at 6 shekels and 8 agarot, and that is the lowest price in five years. Electricity rates dropped by 10.05% for private consumers. A kilowatt for home usage will now stand at 48.6 agarot per hour, down from 54.03. The new prices mean that an average household will save about 550 shekels per year. Taking a look at the local finance and with no currency trading on Sundays, the shekel remains the same, while share prices on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange started off the trading week with a mixed performance. Here's a look at the mid-afternoon numbers. Well, if you like today's weather, the IBA weather team says tomorrow will be more of the same, only with partly cloudy skies and temperatures above average for this time of the year. Here's a look at the forecasted highs and lows at home and abroad for the next 24 hours. That's all for today. Aaron Viner will be at this desk tomorrow to bring you the latest news from Israel. Please join her. Until then, I'm Ariel O'Sullivan wishing you a great evening and shalom from Jerusalem and go Patriots.